Section 9.5, Calculus with Parameterized Curves. So in this section, we'll cover a few basic calculus facts about parametric equations. This will be a fairly short section, as most of the calculus we actually do with parametric equations really happens in Calc 3. Uh, but consider this a, a brief introduction to how to do some calculus with parametric equations. So let's start out with a couple of basic definitions. Um, the first one says a curve in the plane is said to be a parameterized curve if there is some parameterization of that curve. That is, there is some set of parametric equations, say an x equals f of t and a y equals g of t, defined on some interval, which describe that graph. So this pertains to what we talked about in the previous section. If I have a curve and I've described it with a pair of parametric equations, I'll say that that set of parametric equations is a parameterization of that curve. And then I'll say the curve has been parameterized by that set of equations. Um, we will say that that parametric curve is differentiable if the parametric component functions, that is the f of t and the g of t, that describe the x and y coordinates are themselves differentiable functions of t. So what we mean is if x was f of t and y was g of t and this was defined on some interval i, we would say that the curve described, that is the plane curve described by that set of parametric equations on that interval, is itself called differentiable if each of these component functions is simply a differentiable function of t. Okay, pretty basic definition, but it allows us to talk about differentiability of a curve in terms of the differentiability of those component parametric functions. Okay, second definition, we'll say a curve parameterized by f of t and g of t, the x and y functions, on the interval a to b is called a smooth curve if number one, f prime of t and g prime of t are continuous, so that's condition number one, and condition number two, those two derivatives are not simultaneously zero. So just to emphasize this part is saying that f prime of t and g prime of t are not both zero at the same time. Okay, without going into the detail, I'll just uh, say that the word smooth suggests that there are no abrupt changes in the graph like sharp corners. Okay, what do I know about continuous functions? I know that small changes in the input variable produce correspondingly small changes in the output. There are no sudden abrupt movements in the y because a continuous function can't do that. All right, so if the derivatives which measure how the graph is turning in the x and y directions, if those derivative functions are both continuous, it means that this graph can't lurch. It can't make big movements in either the x and the y direction when there is a relatively small change in t. And if you think about it, that's exactly what happens at a sharp corner. If I'm traveling down the curve, so t is moving over an interval, and that means f of t and g of t are moving, and f prime and g prime are the rates of movement of the x and y coordinates respectively, well, when I get down to that corner, what's going to happen? Uh, very abruptly, I'm going to change direction. And let's say, you know, let's say I compare these two locations. Well, the t times might be t1 and t2 that I'm at those two locations. And notice that the y values are very close together for those two different t values, but the x values are quite far apart. And I want the, the behavior to be more uniform than that so that I don't have that kind of an abrupt change in either the x or the y. Uh, 
Okay, and again, without going to more of a proof for this, we'll just say that these two conditions guarantee the smoothness of a curve. That is, there won't be any of these sharp corners. Okay, so that means a curve like this is smooth. A curve like this is not smooth. And it's exactly what you're thinking about from Calc 1. There's something wrong here at this point. Either at least one of those two derivative functions is not continuous, and in fact, perhaps those functions aren't even differentiable at all at these points. Or, as you'll see here shortly, it's possible another thing that could produce this sort of an abrupt change uh, in the path of the graph is that the two derivatives might simultaneously be zero. Uh, these two conditions will guarantee that these sorts of things don't happen. Okay, so that's what we mean by smooth, and this theorem just gives you uh, sufficient conditions for smoothness. Derivatives are continuous and not simultaneously zero. Now beyond these two basic definitions, there's really only a couple of formulas that we want to talk about for the rest of the section. And so the biggest one is this theorem that tells us how to take derivatives of functions of x when we're given parametric functions. So it says suppose we have x equals f of t, y equals g of t, parametric equations, and suppose dx dt does not equal zero and that these component functions are differentiable. Then number one, um, I can find the derivative of y with respect to x by just calculating this quotient of the derivative of y with respect to t divided by the derivative of x with respect to t directly from these two parametric functions. Um, so of course I know that if we're given a pair of parametric functions uh, that describe a curve, uh, if I'm able to eliminate the parameter and relate y directly to x, let's say y equals h of x, then what number one says is I can find the derivative of that function of x, that is derivative of y with respect to x in terms of or from the point of view of a rectangular equation by simply looking at the quotient of the derivatives of these two parametric functions both with respect to t. Okay, the second equation tells me how to take higher order derivatives. So for example, second derivatives, third derivatives, and so on. Uh, just to give you an example, and we'll, we'll do actual examples here in a minute, but when you look at number two, if n was two, it would say that if I wanted to find the second derivative of y with respect to x, then what I'd have to do first is look at this guy or find this guy, which in this case I see would just be dy dx. Okay, now by the way, notice, given parametric functions, number one tells me how to find dy dx. It says it's the quotient of these two. Okay, that means once I find that dy dx, and it would be a function of t, then I could take the derivative with respect to t of dy dx, and then I would simply divide by dx dt. And notice that is exactly the same dx dt that I divided by in this formula up here. Uh, what would the third derivative look like? The formula says, that would be a 3 there, it says you would take the derivative with respect to t of whatever you found for the second derivative of y with respect to x and divide by dx dt. Again, notice the dx dt is frozen. That's not changing. What's happening is every time you take another derivative, in the numerator you're taking the derivative with respect to t of the previous derivative of y with respect to x that you found. And I'll do an example of that in a minute. Uh, let's look at the proof of part one, which is very simple, and you'll easily be able to see where this comes from. Uh, let's think about the chain rule for a minute. Suppose u is a function of x, 
and suppose x is a function of t. Okay, then it would definitely make sense for me to ask what is du dt if u is a function of x and x is also a function of t then of course I could get from t to u by asking what's du dx and then what's dx dt and I know the chain rule says that that should give me the same thing as du dt. Uh, notice that if I divide both sides of that equation by dx dt it says that du dx is equal to du dt over dx dt. Okay, if I replaced that u by a y, for example, and of course that would fit our scenario in this theorem, y being a function of x and x being a function of t, then it would say dy dx can be found by taking dy dt, or I'm just replacing both of these u's by y's, divided by dx dt. Okay, what if I replace that u by a dy dx? Then the left side would be the derivative with respect to x of dy dx, or let's put it this way, it would be d dy dx divided by dx or over dx equals d dy dx dt over dx dt. Okay, that's just the same thing as saying here on the left, second derivative of y with respect to x equals the derivative with respect to t of the first derivative of y with respect to x, that is the previous derivative, divided by dx dt. And that's actually what we claimed here in part two. And you can see that uh, the recursive relationship here with the n and the n minus one is gonna fall out if I continue this process in finding the third derivative from the second, the fourth from the third, and so on. Okay, let's look at a quick example of how this works just to make sure we see it. Let's suppose I have parametric equations x equals 1 over t and y equals negative 2 plus ln t. Uh, let's find dy dx directly from the formula. Now by the way, before we do that, uh, let's just ask can we eliminate the parameter and construct a rectangular equation that relates y directly to x and then take the derivative directly. Well that shouldn't be too hard because it's pretty easy to solve that equation right there for t. That one would say t is equal to 1 over x and then if I substituted that in place of the t in the second equation I would have y equals negative 2 plus ln of 1 over x. Uh, which I could also write as y equals negative 2 plus ln1 minus ln x, so that if I took the derivative, that is dy dx, then what I should get is minus 1 over x. Okay, let's try our formula that we just stated on the previous page, which said I should be able to get to that dy dx by taking dy dt divided by dx dt, where the x and the y I'm referring to there are these parametric equations in terms of t. So what's the derivative of y with respect to t? That would be 1 over t. What's the derivative of x with respect to t? Oops. That would be negative 1 over t squared getting crazy with my colors here. Okay, and of course if I flip that negative 1 over t squared, it looks like I get negative t. Okay, but of course what is t? If I come back up here, t is 1 over x. 
which means my derivative, if I put it back in terms of x, is actually negative 1 over x. Uh, looks like our formula is working, at least in this example. Now, obviously, with functions this simple, it's probably just as quick to eliminate the parameter, get a rectangular equation, and take the derivative in the conventional way. Uh, but be assured, it's not always going to be convenient to do it that way. So there are reasons, as we'll see, especially in Calc 3 for this formula. But uh, let's go ahead and finish out the example and see what it would look like if I tried to take the second derivative of y with respect to x. Okay, now the formula says what? I should take the derivative with respect to t of the first derivative that I got, where that first derivative is expressed as a function of t. So just be careful there. I know the first derivative in terms of x is minus 1 over x, but in terms of t, it's minus t. And so right here in this formula, when they say dy dx, they do mean the derivative you got in terms of t because we're taking a derivative right here with respect to t. Okay, and then what goes in the bottom? Well, that's the nicest part about this formula. It's always the same thing. It's dx dt. And it's the same dx t, dx, dx dt that you calculated here. It will always be that same dx dt over and over again, no matter how many derivatives you take. So that bottom will be negative 1 over t squared. Okay, the top will be the derivative with respect to t of the first derivative, which was minus t. So what do I get? I get minus 1 over minus 1 over t squared, which is t squared. Uh, what would the third derivative look like using this formula? It would be the derivative with respect to t of the second derivative, which is t squared, over dx dt. But what's dx dt? It's still negative 1 over t squared. Okay, what would that be? That would be 2t over negative 1 over t squared. That would be negative 2t cubed. And so on. Okay, that's how we use the formula. Pretty straightforward, I think. Okay, let's look at one last thing, which is arc length. And we're not going to do a lot with this in this class, but as you'll see in the first part of Calc 3, uh, this is a pretty important concept that we're going to come back to and use quite a lot at a certain point uh, in the second chapter that we deal with in that class. So let's suppose we've got a curve. Uh, let's call it uh, y equals h of x. Uh, let's say... The curve starts at x equals c and goes to x equals d. So this would be, let's say, c h of c. And this one would be d h of d, just to put some labels on them. Let's say we're also able to describe this curve with parametric equations. Let's say x equals f of t and y equals g of t uh, on the interval, let's say, a to b. And of course, let's just pencil in the arrows to suggest that the orientation is that way, which of course means that we're saying that first point, that starting point, this one, can also be thought of as f of a, g of a, and this ending point could be thought of as f of a, f of b, g of b. Okay, one thing is for sure, if I think about the rectangular version for a minute, that is where I have y equals h of x going from x equals c to x equals d, you should definitely recall from Calc 1 that the arc length of this curve, that is this portion of the curve from that first point to that second point, 
is the integral from c to d of the square root of 1 plus h prime of x squared dx. And that was the, the big arc length formula that we derived in Calc 1. All right, now let's think about what we've got here. We've got h of x is a rectangular function, but we've assumed here that we've got some parametric functions, f of t and g of t, that also describe this curve. So, of course, in our formula where we have that h prime, I know that's really a conventional rectangular dy dx. Okay, meaning if I ask what is h prime of x, which is really a dy dx, our formula from the first theorem says that that should be dy dt over dx dt. That is where the y and the x are parametric functions, which are the two I have right here. Okay, so that means what? S is equal to integral c to d square root 1 plus h prime, which we're saying now is this guy squared, which means what I've really got under there is a nasty dy dt squared over dx dt squared. In fact, let me make my square root a little bit bigger. And then outside of that is still a dx. Okay, if you're good so far, the only thing I've done is replace that h prime by this dy dt over dx dt. All right, notice the dx, this guy right here at the end. Okay, what are we saying? We're saying x is f prime of t. That means dx, I'm sorry, x is f of t. So that means dx is what? It's f prime of t dt. Of course, what is f prime of t? That's just dx dt. Okay, no surprise there. We're saying in differential notation, dx is equal to dx dt times dt. Uh, that makes sense. So what I'm going to do is rewrite this dx right here at the end as simply dx dt dt. Okay, notice this dx dt is now a separate factor that I can pull back inside the square root. Okay, notice at this point, this is really just still a dx which means my variable of integration is definitely an x value, and I'm to interpret that as x goes from c to d. If I pull that dx dt inside that radical, which means when I do it becomes squared, so that I'll have a square root of a dx dt squared times a 1 plus all that nasty dy dt squared, over dx dt squared, what's left outside the square root? Well, it's just that dt. That is this one right here. Okay, which means now I've changed this to a t integral. Okay, question, what's the interval, the t interval, over which this curve was traced out with these equations? It was the interval a to b which means I've done a change of variables now, and that c to d now changes to a to b. Okay, cleaning up, what do I have? I have integral from a to b. Uh, what happens when I multiply, distribute that dx dt squared through? Well, I'll get a square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. And what you're looking at now is a closed compact formula for finding arc length directly from a pair, a given pair of parametric functions. If I'm given directly x equals f of t and y equals g of t, then we're saying the arc length would be a to b square root f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared with respect to t.
And of course, the A and the B values would be the starting and ending values of T for whatever interval I used to trace out this portion of the curve. Okay, so it's, it's an alternate version. It's basically the parametric equation version of your arc length formula for Calc 1. So there's nothing new here. Uh, you will recall from Calc 1 that we were fairly limited at the time in how many of these we could actually do because at the time we didn't have a lot of tools for integrating things under square roots. Um, we're not going to harp on this now, but realize we do have lots of tools for integrating things under square roots now. Think about all the techniques you learned with trig substitution in Chapter 7. There are a lot of integrals that involve square roots like these that we can handle now that we couldn't have handled in Calc 1. Okay, but in short, that's, that's the other big fact. Um, before we close, let me point out one last thing. This is a notational thing uh, that's often glossed over in this class, but it's, uh, this is the time to point it out. So an important notational thing. Suppose s of t is the integral from a to t square root dx du squared plus dy du squared du. Okay, of course, what am I suggesting there with that integral? I'm suggesting you have a curve and there are parametric functions say x equals f of u and y equals g of u that trace out that curve and the parameter I'm using is u and if I integrate with respect to that parameter over the interval a to t this integral should give me the arc length of that curve from the point where u is equal to a to the point where u is equal to t all right, now, what happens when I take ds dt, which makes sense because if we're saying s is a function of t, I should be able to take the derivative with respect to t. Well, you know from your fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, the first part of that theorem, that if I'm defining a function by an integral where the input variable is really just this upper limit, then you know this first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus says the derivative of that integral will simply be the integrand, this part, where we replace all of those u's by whatever that variable right there is. Okay, that means the derivative would be, let me do that in blue. So the derivative would be the square root of dx dt, that is again where I'm replacing that u by t, and I'm also going to replace that u by t. So that would be the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. And notice that's the same thing as saying ds equals the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. Okay, notice our formula for arc length was integral a to b square root dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. Okay, so the important takeaway here is notice that everything you see right here is simply ds. And so it's not uncommon, especially in the next class, to abbreviate the integral a to b ds and write that for our arc length integral. In fact, we will sometimes call this the arc length differential. And you can see it's definitely a lot shorter to write. Uh, when I write that, I simply know that we're trying to integrate that arc length differential, the one that we had the rectangular version of from Calc 1 and now the parametric version of in Calc 2. It's a shorthand, and you'll see it again in Calc 3, not so much in here.
OK, that's a good place to stop. And that's really all there is to this section. Let me know if you have any questions.